Hello everybody. Uh, new venture today. Never done this. Don't know how to work. Uh, but since we're starting back to our in-person Sunday school class at Falmouth Baptist Church, and I'll be teaching that class, I've had a few comments from folks who uh, have enjoyed watching these online live. So I'm going to try to tape some lessons and continue on with this. Uh, for those that still don't feel comfortable getting out or just need a video a Sunday school lesson, uh, even if we even had a few in our church that will be teaching other classes with children that kind of miss having an opportunity to do an adult class who have said they wish I'd kind of keep going. So we're going to give this a try. I'll be uh, loading this to a, a YouTube channel that I've created. So I'll put those links on Facebook. Hopefully it'll work. Uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, I, uh, as all the YouTube people say, like and subscribe <laughs> if you want notifications. Hit that bell and you'll see when a new video comes up. I'm not really into that. Don't even know how it works. I subscribe to a few uh, YouTube channels myself, but not not a lot. So um, we'll see how this goes. And uh, again, this is a Sunday school lesson. Falmouth Baptist Church is where I typically teach. And certainly if you ever want to join us live, we're there at 945 corner of 4th and Maple um, in Falmouth, Kentucky. would love to have you join us for Sunday school and then worships at 1045. So always like to start off a lesson with a word of prayer and uh, just ask you to bow and join me in prayer. And dear Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity, a, a new opportunity to uh, worship together, study together uh, through this 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 means that, that you've made available to, to mankind, Lord. Father, I just pray that during this time, your spirit would guide me, that you would be with each and every one who watches even a few moments of this video. Father, I lift up those in prayer that are going through difficult times, those who have lost loved ones, those who are just struggling with life in general, Lord, that, that they would turn to you and find peace and comfort. And Father, as always, I, I want to lift up the lost and just pray that they would hear your spirit and they would respond and accept the salvation that you freely give. Just ask that you be with us during this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, continuing on with a series out of Revelation. Uh, if you've been with me on Facebook the last several weeks, you know that we've uh, been studying uh, letters uh, to the various churches uh, that that Jesus directed John to send. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be looking at the letter to the church at Sardis. We'll be reading from Revelation uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. The title of the, led, of the lesson is Vigilant Against Complacency, and the point of the lesson is Stay Alert and Focused on the Things of God. Just always like to start off with a question. I'm going to deviate from the question that's in the book, uh, even though it was kind of good. I, I couldn't really relate to it, but uh, do you ha ever have trouble keeping your focus in life? You know, there are a lot of things in life that, that are distractions, a ton of distractions in our world today. Uh, it, this thing that I'm talking into is a massive distraction for a lot of people, for me at times. Uh, funny, at times I see people in church fiddling around, watching their stuff and uh, texting their buddies and things. So, uh, you know, that's a perfect example of a distraction. Uh, there's a lot of things, though, that, that we need to focus on in life that are good things to focus on. Um, you know, focus on our family life. Focus on our job, our health, uh, our church activities. You know, we put a lot of focus on those things. But even those good things can sometimes cause us to lose our focus on God. And you, you know, it's kind of interesting. You think how could how could a church activity take your focus away from God? Well, it can, and it does, and it certainly did. I think with the church at Sardis, that's what that was part of it. You know, because we can lose that focus, we can become complacent in our walk with God. When we, when we forget what the main focus of our lives should be, like I say, there's a lot of things that are good focuses. There are a lot of things that are distractions that that are not good. Um, most things, by their very nature, are not bad, but can be a distraction and can take us away from where our focus needs to be. And just a little background, the city of Sardis uh, had been a very wealthy and prosperous city. Uh, it was a, on a major trade route, so there was a lot going on in Sardis over the years. It was 
found it, I think, uh, I think I read a 1200 BC. So it had been around a good while by the time this happens, you know, in the first century AD when this letter is written. Um, and, you know, it, it, interesting fact about it, it was the first city to mint coins in gold and silver. So, you know, very uh, high, you know, high tech, if you will, civilization, uh, city. Um, but, you know, a lot of its greatness had been in its past. A lot of much of what it had done great had been in its past by the first century AD. You know, things had sort of gone downhill. Uh, the city had been sacked a few times, and we'll talk about that later in the lesson. It had been a, the victim of a massive earthquake that caused massive destruction um, and really didn't start coming back until the Romans came in and started rebuilding the Acropolis and started rebuilding the city. And it still was never back at its full former glory, but had begun to prosper uh, some. And under the Romans, it became known as a center for its temples to the pagan gods. So it's still, uh, you know, it doesn't have its former glory, but it's still got a lot going on. So we'll read out of Revelation, again, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I'll go ahead and read those verses, and we'll come back and talk about them. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis, Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know you, your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you will have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches." And again, you know, looking at Sardis, uh, and, it, and if you've been with me on some of the lessons in the past few weeks, you know, Jesus starts this letter that he's dictating to John and says, you know, write to the angel at Sardis. And we've already discussed an angel is a messenger. Uh, so basically to the pastor, to the preacher at the church at Sardis, to to that leader, that church leader, you know, here's what I want you to tell you. And, he, and again, he's, he, as we've seen in past week's lessons, he says, thus says the one. Uh, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And that gets into whole deep theological looking at what those uh, those things mean. Revelation is a very complicated book, and there's a lot of symbolism in it. But again, essentially boiling it down to its, its basics is, you know, Christ is again pointing out his deity, his authority. You know, he says to the preacher, Here, here's, what, here's what God is saying. Here's what I'm saying on behalf of God. Here's what you need to do. And it, it's kind of interesting with this letter. If you've been with me in the past few weeks, it seems like most of the letters, the letters we've talked to about so far, Jesus has started out saying, I commend you for this. And tell them, you know, it gives, all, gives the church a really good pat on the back for all the things that they've done and the, that they are doing. And then he follows it up with a, but I hold this against you. A little bit different with the church at Sardis. There's no commendation. There's no praise that starts off. You know, he, he starts off there, right off the bat, thus says the one, you know, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. He gets right to the point, you know, your reputation in the community, you know, your, your reputation in the, church, in, in the community and, and even in your own minds is really good. You're a great, you're an active church, and, and everybody just thinks this is a place to be. This is a happening church. Um, you know, it, the church thought it was alive. It, it, you know, was resting on its good reputation. Um, but, you know, much like the people of Sardis often maybe lived under past glory, the church was perhaps living on its past glory, uh, looking at the things that, you know, all their accomplishments, all the great things they've done, and, and we're just, we have just such a great reputation sort of resting on your laurels, if you will. He says, you know, maybe that's what's going on. And, and, you know, really, this letter, although it was written to the church at Sardis, it's written to every church and every believer today as well. And, you know, there are churches that, and sometimes I feel like my church is that way, that we just sort of lose our focus and we, we, we like to look back and think of the things we've done in the past and how, how good that was. And, 
and then you know maybe sort of rest like say rest on the laurels and i think that's you know that's what what jesus was saying to the church at sardis what he's saying to every church you know to be careful you know that you're looking at your past gloria uh, there's a quote i kind of like from abraham lincoln it's not my lesson but you're going to get it anyway sorry about that but uh, talking about ancestors and people that brag about their ancestors and how great they were. He says, you know, ancestors are a lot like taters, potatoes. The best part is in the ground. You know, when we brag about our ancestors and, and how great that makes us, you know, well, the best part's in the ground. Uh, it's not anything we did. And that's sort of what the church at Sardis, I think, was doing. You know, they they were um, like taters. The best part was already in the ground. And there was some symbolism here going on again because Sardis was known to have a huge cemetery outside the, the the city of town. So the people that were there in Sardis hearing this, when he says you're dead, you know, they could kind of relate to what he's saying about that with, with that cemetery. Um, and then in verse two, you know, he, he says, you know, you know, you all think you're alive. Everybody thinks you're alive, but you're really dead. And in verse two, he starts off, be alert. You know, he's just saying, wake up, wake up church, you know, be alert, strengthen what remains with you. You know, I, Another movie reference, all I could think of, you know, the church is mostly dead. If you've ever watched The Princess Bride, you know, the, the Dread Pirate Roberts, he was just mostly dead. Uh, and the church was mostly dead here in, in Sardis. And he says, you know, you need to revive your spiritual life and you need to do it immediately. He says, if you don't, what is left will soon die as well. You know, like I say, the, the city of Sardis was known, uh, they, they liked to think they had this they, were, they had a reputation of being an impregnable city a city that could not be conquered but at least twice before Christ's time we know historically that the city had fallen uh, fallen under siege and had fallen to outside conquerors so it was not impregnable from from attacks a human attack we also know as I mentioned that massive earthquake that destroyed much of the city so it was also you know not immune from natural disaster so you know, the, the folks at Sardis were, Sardis were resting on that. They had that reputation of being impregnable, but they really weren't. And the church was so, sort of doing the same thing, you know, sort of like, you know, we're pretty good. We're, we've done a lot of good things, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of those things that we remember, really, it really wasn't quite that way. I heard a speaker once say that the, when we look back at the good old days, the good old days really weren't, you know, they weren't, if you stop and think they, were, they weren't always so great and so good, but, you know, the, the church was doing that, you know, they were failing in their mission, contrary to the reputation, they were failing in their mission that, that God had given them, that, that, that they had been given by Jesus, by the disciples, you know, they had failed. And he, Jesus says right there in, in the second half of verse number two, he says, you know, for I have not found your works complete. I have not found your works complete before my God. You have this reputation. You think you're all great. You think you're wonderful. You're a great church. And that's your reputation. But I've looked at really what's going on. You're not so hot. I've found you lacking. And it, then in verse 3, moving on to 3, he says, Remember then, remember what you've received, what you've heard. Remember the gospel. Remember the blessings that you've received, the things that you have been given, the joy that you had when you first came to Christ. You know, and remember that mission you've had. He says, remember it and keep it. You know, hold tight to it. You know, I sort of think of muscles, you know, that atrophy because of, of lack of use. You know, as I get older, I've got there's things I can't do that I could do when I was younger. I'm not as strong as I was. And, and part of that is just natural age and some of it's deterioration. But some of it's I don't use those muscles anymore. So I've, I've kind of lost some of that strength. And, and that's, that's the same way with our spiritual life. If we don't use it, you know, it's going to atrophy from non-use. He says, keep it, hang on to it. And he says, and repent. You know, seek God's forgiveness. Return to God. You know, part of that looking back and remembering and trying to get this right and, and instead of living on your reputation is realizing where you're failing. Realize where you have failed, church, uh, at Sardis and church today and Christian today. You know, look back on what you had, hang on to it, and then seek forgiveness for where you failed. You know, we all fail. It, it just happens. It, it's part of life. We're not perfect. We will never be perfect. Uh, Jesus was the only perfect person um 
But, you know, when we have those shortcomings, when we fail, we need to repent. As a church, we need to repent from time to time, certainly as individuals. And that's what Jesus was saying to the church at Sardis. Repent, seek God's forgiveness, return to them. And then he gives a really strong and stern warning. He says, you know, if you're not alert, you know, remain alert. But if you don't, I will come like a thief in the night. You won't even know when I'm coming. And you'll know, not know what hour I come upon you, but I'm coming. Judgment is coming. And in the Bible, you know, we talk about judgment. Final judgment is, is often talked about, and it's sometimes talked about in Revelation. And that's that final judgment after we die, and, you know, we stand before Christ and, and we're judged. But sometimes there is judgment that occurs here on earth, um, and it happens in our lives. I'm not saying every bad act results in a judgment that God's going to come down and punish you and change things around, but sometimes it does. And he, here, the, the theologians that, that wrote this lesson think that, you know, Jesus is talking about, a judgment, immediate judgment. He says, you know, if you don't do that, if you don't remain alert, I'm going to come like the thief of the night and you, you can rest on your church and your pretty building and all the fancy stuff you've got in it and all the things you used to do and all the plaques on the wall and all the, the softball trophies you've got out in the hallway or wherever, or, you know, that you've won or your, you know, your volleyball stuff or your chili cook-offs or whatever you've done. And he said, I'm going to take it all away. And it's going to be like a thief, you know, and Jesus talks, you know, we think about that thief that comes at night. You know, if you know one's coming, you, you know, when you know someone's coming, you, you prepare. You prepare for that person that you think is going to come and attack you, that's going to invade your home. You prepare and defend against it. But most of us, when we, you know, when a thief comes, you don't know what, they don't announce, hey, I'm coming to rob you tonight. There's a few dumb ones out there that'll do that. I mean, I've, I've encountered them as a prosecutor over the years, some really, really dumb criminals. Uh, you know, I had a boy who was pulled over for speeding or something, and a trooper says, you have any marijuana in the car? The kid says, no, I don't have it. He says, but I've got some at home. <laughs> and the trooper just looks at him, will you take me there? The kid's like, sure, I'll take you. Takes him home and shows him where all his dope is and gets arrested for simple speeding. You know, uh, criminals are dumb, but a lot of them, you know, will come when you, they'll come when you don't expect. That's what Christ's saying. You know, you don't have any idea when I'm coming. And he says, you know, by repenting, there's still time to change the ship. There's still time to guard against that coming. Um, so, you know, it, it's a, it's a warning from Christ to the church at Sardis. It's a warning for us as individuals, for our churches. If we find ourselves sort of losing our focus, and like I say, losing our focus sometimes can be, you know, church activities, church programs. Um, th those things are all great. You know, it's important that we have them. But when we have them, we need to remember, why are we having them? Are we having them as a form of entertainment? Are we having them just to do something good for the community? Um, are we having them because we want to reach people? You know, are we going to follow up on them? You know, the, those things that, you know, the, the why instead of just focusing on programs. And, and I'm sure if you go to church, you've heard your pastor talk about it. I know I've heard mine and, and lots of church speakers. You know, programs are great, but you can lose your focus. You can focus so much on your job that you, you neglect your duty to your family. Uh, I've known people that they just brag about how much they work and their kids never know them. Their spouse never knows them because they've lost focus on other things that are important. And that can happen with our church lives. You know, we can just lose that focus by focusing in and zeroing in on all the stuff we're doing, all the busyness we're doing, but are we accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish? Um, I think back, uh, again, I, I, I get a lot of references to movies and stuff, and I apologize, but, but I remember a movie once, and there was a committee throughout the entire movie, and our church committee, and it's it's a horrible movie. Before I was a Christian, I I enjoyed part of it, but it's kind of a, you know, they're a church group, and they spent the whole movie going around. Every time you saw them, they're debating what are we going to name ourselves? What are we going to name our movement? They never do a darn thing, but boy, they're they're anxious to do it. And sometimes that's you know how we get with our church life. We're we're you know we we have meetings and committees and. We get so focused on that, we forget what we're doing. We forget what our purpose is. 
And, and you know, again, I think that's what this lesson, the part of this lesson, is all about. This church at Sardis, you know, they had they had lost their focus. They forgot. And, and I'm gonna move on um, into verse four, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm hammering on the bad stuff, hammering on the bad part of the church, and, and the bad things that that we do, you know, that those things. But you know, we we have to focus on those. We have to remember it. But then Jesus says, you know, there in verse four, but you have a few people who have not defiled your clothes. You know, the majority of the church has lost sight of the mission, but there's a minority in there that remains true. Uh, it says they would walk with him in white. You know, their sins would be forgiven. Again, there's some symbolism going on here, some analogy that the church at Sardis there was a sect that was known about walking down to the river in their white robes and being cleansed, and, and they weren't Christians, but, you know, it was one of the pagan things. But, you know, you, you wear that white, and you think, oh, I'm, I'm cleansed, and, you know, oh, brother, we're out there. They're all walking down to the, down, going down to the river. <laughs> and, you know, that big song was out, gosh, probably 10, 20 years ago by now, but everybody was all, you know, in white, you know, but, but you know they were still filthy inside. They had a white robe on the outside, and that was a church at Sardis. But Jesus said, "There are some of you. There's some that have not lost your focus. That you have walked with me in white." And He says, "I will find you worthy. Those people will be found worthy because of the righteousness of Christ, because of their faith in Christ, their devotion to Christ." And then in verse 15, he says, "Those people will never be erased from the book of life." They'll never lose their citizenship in heaven, and they'll be acknowledged before the Father by Christ. You know, as Baptists, we don't believe you can lose your salvation, and I don't think that's what this is saying. You know, but there are a lot of people sitting in a lot of churches, and I'm not being judgmental because there are times I wonder if maybe I'm one of them that are sitting there that have walked the aisle, that have had been baptized, proclaimed their faith in Christ, but their life was never changed. You know, as Baptists, we believe they really were never saved. You know, they don't lose their salvation because they really, you know, they, they basically walked the aisle, made a proclamation, and took a public bath, as one of my former pastors used to call it for, for folks that had a baptism that was, was meaningless. Um, you know, but but for those that, that remain worthy, for those that repent, for those that follow, that stay alert, that keep their focus. And again, we're all going to come up short from time to time. And I think that's what this lesson is saying. While there's still time, you know, when you mess up, you know, there's time. Get it right. Get right with God. Repent. Get your focus back where it needs to be. He says, you know, Jesus won't forget you for that. He won't forget you. But it is, it is a warning to us about losing our focus. You know, he, he ends up with that, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. There are a lot of passages where Christ uses that similar language, let all who have ears to hear listen. And when he says that, and of course everything that Christ says is important, but when he says that, he's really saying, listen close to what I tell you. This is important. Don't. This is important stuff. Don't forget it. You know, don't forget the things that I've told you. And he says, don't rest on your laurels. Don't don't get comfortable. Don't get comfortable with your walk. Don't, you know, forget why you're doing it. Don't lose your focus. So that's kind of the lesson. I, I, one of the beauties of this, I, you know, I always quit when I'm done. I don't like to talk just to hear myself talk. I, I don't get paid by the word. I don't get paid at all. But, um, so don't think that, but you know, when I'm done, I'm done. But, you know, I think it's something we all need to take to heart from time to time is just where is our focus? What is our focus in our walk with Christ? If you're saved, you know, are you like me? You know, you need from time to time to, to get your focus back on, on what's important, why you do what you do. If you're lost, you know, where is your focus? I certainly would encourage you to, to listen to the spirit that calls to you and accept that salvation. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up with that. I'm going to try to get this posted uh, and with a link on my Facebook page so that you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, those of you that followed, let me know. Send me a comment, direct message me, uh, something instant message, text, call, smoke signals, however. Uh, and let me know if there's problems, things I can do better, or, or if, if it's even worthwhile. So just uh, pray that God, you know, that you'll, Pray that uh, 
you know, you'll have a blessed week. Enjoy the 4th of July weekend. Uh, spend time with families. Don't blow off any of your fingers. And, um, you know, if, if this works, uh, and Lord willing, I'll, I'll continue to, to post some lessons for the foreseeable future. So God bless you. Thanks for joining in and putting up with me and, uh, ha have a, have a blessed week and God bless you.